Pro wrestling fans, if you know wrestling from about 25, 30 years ago, then you better know this man right here to my left. He is one of the greatest professional wrestlers ever, from one of the greatest professional wrestling families ever, and from one of the greatest territories I've ever seen. World-class championship wrestling, always rocked the sportatorium in fine fashion. Dallas Stadium, the end zone, up in the bleachers, wherever it was, you saw people like this gentleman right here. He is, of course, Kevin Von Erich. Kevin, it's a pleasure to have you here, my well, friend. It's good to be here. I, uh, you know, uh, we had a great time in Texas and we were kind of in a lucky way where we had some uh, leeway to kind of be creative and do what we wanted. We didn't really like the way, you know, the old wrestling style was. Right. So we wanted to be more aggressive and more and with a quicker pace. Mm -hmm. And uh, my sons are being bro are breaking in Japan right now and they're uh, going to be in uh, getting their license here and they go back to Japan, but uh, they're the same way. That's they want to be solid, snug, and I mean, uh, the nose, the teeth, the low bows stay out of that, but everything yeah. else, give it 100%. Well, you know, you, you just said something really nice there about you wanting to be different, you want to be revolutionary, and I think that world class was. World class was very much ahead of its time. Uh, you had great feuds, you know, the Freebirds, of course, people like Chris Adams and Gino Hernandez and all the greats. Jimmy Garvin was there. I mean, you name it, they were in world class, and that's, I think, the thing that most fans can relate to is that the way it was revolutionary and way ahead of its time. I was talking Talking to people out here yesterday and they said did you see Kevin Von Erich I says absolutely he says the one thing I loved about the world class is that how much it was already ahead of its time and that's you know great memories it was a lot of fun that's just mm -hmm. when we did it we wanted to enjoy ourselves and right. so you know I was a football player my brother was a discus thrower and the other Dave was a basketball player so we really never saw wrestling yeah. as our future but it was a summer job that lasted 22 years and wow. and, and it was just <laughs> you know it was fun yeah. I enjoyed it that's awesome you know you talk about the greats like Kerry Von Erich your brother of course David and and Mike and of course Chris and your father Fritz I mean you talk about a wrestling family the Von Erichs always come first to my mind um, when you grew up did you want to be a professional wrestler because I've heard a lot of people say you know I've heard the Von Erichs didn't want to wrestle they were forced into the business can you set the record straight yeah as a matter I hear that all the I time bet. everybody <laughs> says oh Mike didn't want to wrestle the, the truth to it is Mike, all of the brothers wanted to wrestle except me. Really? I didn't want to do it. I wanted to play football, and I was determined that I was that's what I was going to do. And uh, if I didn't do that, I wanted to be a marine biologist. Really? That's where my yeah. Wow. And I was and so wrestling was just like I said, a summer job that kept that just lasted on and on. But when I knew when I got in the ring that I was going to give a hundred percent, give right. it all I had, and I knew a day would come when I was would be too old to give the people the kind of product that I was used to putting forth in the ring and so I wanted to get out and so people think I retired early 22 years <laughs> I don't think so but it was uh that's how it went you know what a heck of a summer job for 22 years being a professional wrestler as a Von Eric here I had crappy jobs in the summer like working at the A&P and pushing garbage down the street I mean that's a great summer job and what a career it turned out to be for you now I know tonight here at the Gold Coast Hotel in Las Vegas Nevada you're gonna be hitting the card table in a little bit you you told me you're a big blackjack player. Are you a big winner all the time? No, I'm not anything like that at all. <laughs> Money comes by is not that easily cut to, you know, I'm not a rich guy. Yeah. And so, uh, no, I don't gamble. Money's too hard to work for. You got that right, especially having a 22-year summer job, for sure. But, right, Kevin, right. it's a pleasure and an honor, my friend. Like I said, there's a lot of people here tonight. But when I saw you were going to be here, I was just like, oh, my God, this is one of the people I've always wanted to meet. And I truly mean that. Uh, you're a heck of a guy. You're, you, I know you're a big family man. You talked about your sons and your wife and you're living the life like you should right now and I wish you all the best of health well, we and luck. Know, let me just tell you before I go, I sure. mean, I, Brian Blair is a real friend of mine and oh, I, I think the world of him and, and that's why I'm you know doing this with you but I also want to tell you my sons, uh, Mar my son Marshall is mentioned, you know, 470 pounds, 19 years old and my other son Ross was a football player 
a great football player in Texas, and wow. they are ready to go yeah. now, and they're going to give it that style that we're talking about. So let's see how it works out. See wow. if I'm right. I'll bet you wrestling's in for a change. Oh, I, I can believe that, especially because if you go back about 25 years ago, it did change with World Class Championship Wrestling and the Von Erichs. I'd love to see a new batch, a new breed to come through and just make it all happen again. Let well, history repeat itself. Well, remember I said this. That's going to happen. All right. And this is April 18, 2012. So you heard it here first on Off the Top Rope, and of course, with the Cauliflower Alley Club all over the place. We're having a great time. And again, Kevin, thank you so much, sir. You bet, Brian. Glad to do it. All right. You're a great guy. And we'll see you soon, guys. Don't go away. we got more interviews coming. All right, wrestling fans, Brian Shank back with you once again here at the Cauliflower Alley Club, the year 2012 at the Gold Coast Hotel, Las Vegas, Nevada. Sin City is where it's at. All the great superstars are walking around here. There's a tremendous amount of people. People from Georgia, people from Florida, people from California. All over. They're all over the place. And this beautiful young lady right here is, of course, the one and only, the great Ivory. Good to see you. Good to see you, Brian. It's really fun to be here. Cauliflower Alley Club. We're in our third day. So everybody's kind of walking around with raspy voices. Mm -hmm. Me too. Uh. <laughs> because we just don't know when to quit. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's this feeling of like, you know, we're still warming up. And what is it? Like noon, one, yeah. two o'clock? Yeah. So, you know, because that's because we go to bed at 3 in the morning. That's exactly right. But anyway, tonight we have, um, well, today we're doing autograph signings. We have a lot of the legends walking around. We have the glow girls are here. Yeah, one of my favorite. Yeah. All, all together again. Mm -hmm. And they're, they've got a movie coming out, the glow documentary, and that's going to be having some screenings. There's mm -hmm. some screenings in Newport, California yeah. and L.A., California coming up in early May. Mm -hmm. So that's exciting. So they're all, you know, chatting about that. There's a buzz about that. Well, you should know about the Glow Girls because obviously at one time you were known as Tina Ferrari and you Tina Ferrari, you got yeah. the little, you got the new Tierra. It was been it's been fixed up. It's yeah. been restored. It's the new 2012 version of the of the Tierra, which and it looks right. great. Well, of course, when I was packing for CAC this year, and it is my first Cauliflower Alley Club. There's so many attendees here that have been here for, you know, 20 years mm -hmm. it, or and more. Right. So it's really um, I think I'm going to be addicted to the the convention come every year now That's awesome. and um yeah so what do you do you're gonna this convention you're going to you don't know what to expect you're i live on an island i never dress up anymore had oh. to pack first thing i packed oh. was the glow crown i knew it i knew that was gonna be the first thing you packed and hopefully this was the second i well, it looks great. Well, I knew that I would see the girls and that everybody, you know, should be able to put the glow crown on. So it was all in shambles, yeah. falling apart and the letters were falling off. And the two, it's like two tiaras, Vegas style, because mm. it was all our costumes were made in Vegas, mm. stacked on together. You know, it's like mega tiara. <laughs> so I had a neighbor friend fix it all up That's and it's great. beautiful now. It does look So I'll have to pass it around and get all the girls to try it on and yeah. stuff. But You know, the great memories, of course, that's what we share here at the Cauliflower Alley Club, or as we call it more affectionately, the CAC. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you've seen all the people out here. We saw Lightning. She was walking around yeah. there. And then you see a lot of people like, well, one of my favorites, Judy Martin, who's a yes. great former, oh, former women goodness. wrestler. Yeah. And yourself, of course. And, you know, you look fantastic. And Thanks. it looks like you could step in the ring right now with anybody out there and just whoop their ass. And I'm talking males, too. Well, I probably could whoop their ass if the match lasted about 20 seconds. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> You got the stamp. You won't blow up in 20 seconds. Oh, I come on. <laughs> well, it, we had um, the very first evening, we had a wonderful event with 14 matches in a really great wrestling mm -hmm. uh, card. Yep. And I was just amazed at, you know, that's what it takes to put on a good show is these young athletes. Yeah. And actually, we had a few old timers in there, mm -hmm. too, that were really fun to watch. Absolutely. So um, anyway, the, the best way to wrestle is when you're in shape for wrestling, which Ivory is not in shape oh, for wrestling. I don't believe that. Well, believe it. I, I think you could probably okay. like throw me across the room right now without even trying. <laughs> well, all, all of um, just being around the wrestlers and the workers and the up and coming workers, it really it does kind of uh, work on your yeah. wiring because it makes you go, oh, I want to get in there. There you go. We're going back a little bit here now, okay? We're in serious mode. Okay. Tonight, Ivory, you are Everybody facing you are facing Jacqueline outside in the ring. She wants a piece of you. She's been talking back oh and stage gosh. all of it. Tell me about it. What are you going to do to Jacqueline out there when you get inside the ring with her? It's not what I'm going to do to Jacqueline when I get in the ring. It's all the prayers I'm going to say before I get in the ring. <laughs> before I get in the ring. Well, she can still go, too. No, yeah, my goodness. Yeah, yeah, she's a powerhouse. And, you know, I was just really glad to um, hear from the other lady wrestlers when they came on board, like Molly Holly. She's mm, a great worker. She's awesome. And uh, I, I went up to Molly Holly once after her first match with Jackie Moore. And I said, well, how was it? How was it? She said, I feel like I just got hit by a truck. <laughs> I said, oh, thank God. It's not just me. <laughs> 
I think I'd probably be saying the same thing. She is one You would. Tough. She's I guarantee tough. She's you, tough. you would. Where can the fans find you? Are you on Facebook? Are you on Twitter? I mean, if they want to communicate with you, send you an email, say, um, hey, we love you. It doesn't seem that you need to have Facebook or Twitter because they just call my house. Really? Yeah, I get letters in the mail at my house. And Do you answer them? Um, I haven't yet oh, because yeah. it, you know, it all takes time. Mm. It doesn't mean that it doesn't matter to me at all because right. I save every single one of them and they're all in a box. Mm -hmm. And I do have full intention on getting some kind of wonderful system <laughs> to I, communicate and right. socially network. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. I mean, using the right lingo. That's it. That's it. With the fans and friends and the legends and the glow girls and everybody out there. But. You know, it's a big world, and it's hard to stay in touch with every single person, isn't it? It is. It's very hard. Yes, I know what you mean, because the bill collectors, they keep sending me stuff in the mail, too, and I just can't answer all of them. I don't have all the money. You got fan you mail. I got bill collectors. Time. I know. Well, there you go. Yeah. It's tough, isn't it? Yeah, it is. I don't have the time or the money. <laughs> so, listen, I'll tell you what. Lisa Moretti right here, Ivory, Tina Ferrari, whatever you want to call her. I call her classy. I call her beautiful. Hey, She's a fan. Of, a new friend so of mine. Nice. A new friend of mine here in the wrestling business. I can't wait to have you on the radio show. I can't wait for all the wrestling fans out there to see this and really appreciate how great you look and how great you sound and okay. how great you are with the fans. That's the big thing. So thanks for being a part well, of this. Well, friends, the fans are just friends that you have all over the world. That's, That's what right. I always say. Yeah. Well, thanks for being a part of Cauliflower Alley Club. I know you'll be here next year. Yes. You're going to be looking even more beautiful next year, if that's possible. And uh, we're just glad to have you here. Everybody's having a great time seeing you. You're signing autographs. You're taking pictures. It's a mm -hmm. wonderful thing. That's what it's about here at the CAC. It's a brotherhood. It's a sisterhood. Yeah. It's all about the fans. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm receiving an award tonight. Yes, you are. I was going to bring I that up. yet to write the speech. She wrote one word down on her notebook. I one saw word. it. One word. And maybe, you know, after, I mean, this is a, what, a room full of workers. Yes. And we have several honorees receiving, um, if I do this, you do that, and you do this. <laughs> <laughs> so there are several awards going out tonight, yeah. so maybe it would be very appropriate mm -hmm. just to have one word. Well, maybe so, and then you can just walk away and take more pictures. Yeah. I like that idea. <laughs> well, congratulations to you. This is going to be a great event for you. I can't wait to see everybody out there tonight. There's been a lot of rumors about some other people showing up. Yeah. So we'll definitely see. I, I, I would... think we know who we're talking about. Oh, hell yeah. <clears throat> <laughs> Right. We'll leave it at that. Lisa, thank you so much. We're going to be coming back with some more interviews. Do not go away. Thank you once again to Miss Ivy right here. We're coming back with more hey, interviews. Stone Cold Steve Austin. Hey, he's there. Let's go Woo! get him. All right, wrestling fans, we're here at the Cauliflower LA Club in Las Vegas, Nevada, 2012. This is the 47th annual showing of this event, and what a great time we're all having. People like this right here, my buddy Bill DeMott from World Wrestling Entertainment, you are having a blast. I can see it all over you. You're smiling. The Super Bowl champion, Giants are on your shirt. There's a smile on your face. Yeah. You're loving life, baby. You know, you, you bring the Giants shirt into it. 47 years Cauliflower Alley. I'm 47. It's in Vegas. I've been to Vegas. That's all I got. I didn't know where I was going. That's a great time. I, I been around 24 years yeah. doing this stuff, and you see the guys you see, and you meet people. And I felt like a little kid last night because I had the chance to sit in the back of this room. Yeah. And I saw Dick Byer. Oh. All you cats who don't know who Dick Byer is, one shame on you. All you veterans of the road, yeah. Google it. Google. Highlight for me. Kevin Von Erich, uh, highlight for me. He's going to be up here in just a few minutes, actually. <laughs> Always listen to Harley Race, a highlight for me. When I get to sit with Ricky Steamboat and Jim Ross, and then Les Thatcher's to the left of me, and Bach Winkles to the right of me, man, oh man. It's, it's like we died and went to wrestling heaven. You've got all the greats here this year. It's unbelievable. It, sh it should be like yeah. that. So, you know, for once a year to come out like that, and uh, the, the, good, the good and the bad of it is for the years you come here and you start missing the faces because we all get older and we all yeah. you know things happen but it's good to see the younger cats mm -hmm. coming in and picking the brains man mm -hmm. i'm a big fan of picking the brains there so it's go. it's a lot of fun i brought my three-year-old son who sat there with ricky steamboat and had a uh, fruit eating contest with brian blair last night i think my boy beat him brian said he didn't lose but i think he hit my kid when i wasn't looking <laughs> but, but nothing but fun and yeah. tonight's the big the big one. The big inductions. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting honored tonight. I don't yeah. know how that works. I think JR had something to do with that, so I got to buy some barbecue sauce, yeah. but I'll, I'll leave it out somewhere. <laughs> but you better buy a case. Just just a lot of fun yeah. to, to be here. Cauliflower Alley is a great deal. Yes. Vegas is a great place for it. And, uh, yep. Did I mention Kevin Von Erich? I, I, I was going to mention Kevin Von Erich again, actually, because <laughs> when you saw him, I saw him, I was like, oh, 
was like, oh, man, a long time ago, I knew Kevin. And you just, you just like you said, you yeah. get the re-click. And the Ivory's here. Yes. And I was with Ivory last night. And I got you scared. You were? Did your wife know about that? Well, my wife was there, too. But oh. that's a whole different show because my son was here and the pie eating, con or oh, was fruit eating. <laughs> but, but me and Ivory go way back to a few Tough Enoughs a couple yeah, hundred yeah. years ago. And, and we just picked up right where we left off. And... Nothing but fun. Well, you know, it's funny you said the Tough Enough show because Ivory was a big part of that. Of course, you were as well, Big John. And the Tough Enough series was fantastic. I love the last one. And if you were in Tough Enough and you had to face this guy each and every day to make sure you're doing the right thing, boy, I prayed for you because you didn't take any guff from these guys. Well, I was I was the nice one of the bunch. And when you have Steve Austin, oh, hell yeah. if Stone Cold pulls me aside at 630 every morning because we ran 15 miles a day before we uh, trained, and if he's barking in my ear to do the right thing, then you do the right thing. Yeah. Yeah. But those kids are here. Yeah. AJ's here. Martin's here. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Matt Cross is here. They're yep. all here. They all want to learn. Yep. And Tough Enough's a good deal. We're coming back for another season. Some people call it season two. I think it's season four to three. But Stone Cold and I will be uh, banging some doors down again. And that was a lot of fun, too. And if... Uh, I mean, I think that's what got me to Cauliflower Alley. There so, you go. And you are going to be awarded tonight. I can't wait to see that Men's Honoree Award. That's a big, big honor here in the Cauliflower Alley Club because you've had the greats of people like Sergeant Slaughter get the awards. Uh, you've had people like Wendy Richter who's going to get it tonight. Ivory, all the people out there, it means something to be in that. Congratulations to Thank you. That's you a very much. great honor, man. Very, very honored. Uh, humbled. Yeah. Honored's a great word. So. I don't, I'm not sure I deserve it, but I'm sure as hell I'm going to try to accept it. I, I think you deserve it. You're a great guy. You've worked <laughs> hard in this business. You. When you look back at the, all the gimmicks, of course, with Hugh Morris and, of course, General Erection and whatnot, but Bill DeMott is the man. He's the one who makes everything happen around here. And watch out tough enough. If those people are watching right now, get a load of this guy. You don't want to piss him off. So, Bill, thanks for being here, man. Thank you, man. I appreciate right. it. Always great to see you. As, as well here. We're going back. We'll see some more interviews coming up. I believe I've been hearing some knocking on the door, possibly. Uh, Eric. Kevin Von Eric might be here. We'll be right back. Don't go away. All right, wrestling fans, we're back here once again. Of course, the CAC, the Cauliflower Alley Club in Las Vegas, Nevada, 47th annual for the year 2012. Everybody's walking around here. Bill DeMott, Ivory, of course. We saw Rock and Robin a few moments ago. Ricky the Dragon, Steamboat, Kevin Von Eric, and the, one of the greatest managers I've ever seen right here. He handled the four horsemen, and that was no easy task. In the days of Jim Crockett promotions, of course, the great J.J. Dillon is with us. How you doing, J.J.? I'm doing great. Good. And I, I look forward every year to coming back here in my voice is a little hoarse, but uh, I'm here and uh, just thoroughly enjoying myself. I thought you were going to say my voice is a little horseman. I thought you were going to go oh, with well, that. I don't know. <laughs> you picked up on that, huh? <laughs> yeah. no. I try a little bit, but you know, JJ, the great thing about this place, we keep talking about it, the Gold Coast Hotel, they really know how to cater to our needs. And not only that, but you and the people I just mentioned before that, you're about the fans. You're about being here. You're about sharing memories and stories, doing an interview with us, signing autographs and taking pictures. That's what makes the CAC such a special place. Well, I, I, I say every year, and it's true, that I feel that I take away far more than I contribute. Uh, it's a chance for me to come here and see guys uh, that I knew, traveled with, uh, competed with, were friends with, that if it weren't for uh, the reunion at CAC, uh, where I know that these guys are going to be here, we wouldn't have uh, these opportunities to meet. And at the same time, it's great for the fans too because mm -hmm. years ago back in the day we were very, we were very isolated from the fans right. we would come in the back door of the arena um you know have our matches get back in our car leave to go wherever and, and unless there was a chance meeting in a convenience store or something oftentimes the, the fans never never interacted with us one-on-one -on -one. so that's all changed the fans come here from all over the world it's a very relaxed atmosphere it's a couple of days so there's like no urgency well geez if i don't see this guy right now and get the picture this moment you know yeah. uh, they know that they're going to have uh, accessibility the food is great here mm -hmm. and it's it's just a fun time and the thing that that i became a lifetime member i was around 2005 mm -hmm. and i had been approached about coming here and it, there was always I had either just missed that reunion that year or, or had some something already committed and finally I managed one year to say look I'm going to circle the date and I'm going to be here <laughs> and I came here and met Bob Orton Sr. who oh, yeah. I first saw as a fan when I was a kid 
And then later on uh, in his last territory, I was wrestling in Amarillo when he was there and then he moved on and fast forward another 20 years later, came to Cauliflower Alley and I saw this guy sitting in a wheelchair across the room and said, ah, the face, of it. Hey, that's Bob Orton Sr. Oh, yeah. wow. And I went over and uh, had some quality time with him. Right. Anyway, he, he passed away two months after that. Wow. And so that really impacted me that, that it was so important to me that I had been there for the first time and then I felt bad that I had not become a lifetime member and attended many years before that and got a chance to to get to know people like Lutez that yeah. uh, that I missed out on those opportunities so those of you that uh, are listening and watching um, take a lesson from me uh, this is a wonderful thing to come to you'll have a good time Vegas uh, is a fun town for anything that you want to do, oh, but excellent. really there's enough going on yep. at the Cauliflower Alley reunion yep. with uh, the, the tournaments, the bowling tournament, yep. and, and of course, if you, uh, the hotel itself, you know, there's everything yep. here. And uh, like for me, I come here and, and, and never leave the hotel for the three days. So <laughs> it's, really a, it's really a fun time. I, I like how you say that because I park my car on Tuesday when I get here. I come inside, check in. I don't go to my car again until I leave on Thursday. So I know what you're talking about. And right. JJ, I'd be uh, beating a lot of letters and upset people if we didn't show that Four Horsemen oh. Hall of Fame ring right there from the World Wrestling Entertainment this past WrestleMania 28. Look at that. That is a beautiful piece of work right there. Yeah, it's. Uh, I'm just so proud of this. Uh, I had a storybook career. Uh, I had just so many good things happened to me over my lengthy career. Uh, a lot of it was luck being in the right place at the right time. A lot of it was help from people along the way. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, you just hope that you make it and enjoy some success uh, in this profession. But the thought of, of getting recognition for something like Hall of Fame yeah. is just something that you just you don't even dare to dream about. And it became a reality for me to get to see the, the other horsemen, which we don't get to get together that often. Yeah. And so it was really special and a mm -hmm. fabulous weekend in, in Miami, but then it was a prelude. I knew it was coming here. So it's been a, uh, a busy month for me and oh, a yeah. fun month. Oh, yeah. And hey, you were telling me about your schedule. I don't think the president is even that busy, to be honest with you. I mean, you're all over the place between your other job and your commitments and the Cauliflower Alley and fan conventions and whatnot. You are definitely a busy man, but it's good to have you here at CAC. Let's show that ring the right way. This is the symbol of excellence here. Of course, with J.J. Dillon, the manager of champions. That is a beautiful piece of work right there. You're very well deserving of that. And, of course, the CAC, we're amongst friends. It is a brotherhood. And remember, this is the symbol of excellence. No, others do need not need to apply. Thanks again, JJ. Thank I appreciate you, Brian, it. Brian, and thanks to the fans for everything. All right, there you go. We're coming back with some more interviews. Don't go away. Hi, wrestling fans. Brian Shank back with you here at the Cauliflower Alley Club here in Las Vegas, Nevada. We talked about it. It's a wonderful event, and the reason is we get to see a lot of old friends, make new ones, but right here is definitely an old friend of mine. He is, of course, Scrap Iron Adam Pierce. I hate saying this, former NWA champion, but I have a belief that you'll be getting that back relatively yeah, soon. I mean, you could say former as long as you say four time along with that. Well, there you go. It sweetens it a little bit. <laughs> Absolutely. You know, Adam, we've been friends for, what, 15, 16 years now at least? Uh, more than that, probably. Yeah. Going Let's back see. to Waukegan, Illinois. Yep, yep. Yeah. yeah, a long time ago. In fact, I want you people to understand that anyone who is a problem with me in the wrestling business can blame Brian Shank because ostensibly it's his fault that I'm here right now. Actually, me? You. Oh, okay. You. Well, You're the cause. I've been getting a lot of, I've been getting a lot of dirty looks here Lately. Maybe that's what's going on. Cause, effect. Yeah, well, that's how it works. That's not a bad no. cause and effect. Yeah, yeah. Four time champion, of course, the NWA. And you know what, Adam? I remember watching your career when you first started out. Sonny Rogers, of course, we're talking about Pro Wrestling International right. out of Chicago. Some of the greats out there, like Randy Ritchie. We talked about Trevor Blanchard earlier, who's here as well. He's out by the pool getting a right. tan. He needs one. Yes. And, uh, you know, all the great things that you've done here. How do you feel so far at this stage in your career, 2012, the One Last Ride Tour? Right. Um, how do you feel what you've done so far in this business? Has it been everything that you were hoping for? You know, I mean, it's been so much more than I could have hoped for. And right. I think kind of looking back on things down memory lane, that, that, that the way things have gone down, yeah. you know, since our beginnings, yeah. 15, 16, 17 years ago, whatever it yeah. is, all I really ever wanted to do was wrestle. Mm -hmm. So having that one match and then kind of seeing what has happened from that point forward, it's all kind of like a, a humongous load of icing on the cake. Yeah. Yeah. 
uh, very fulfilled and very, very gratified and humbled. I love it. Nice. Yeah. Now, you know, you've wrestled all over the world. I mean, literally, I, you can, people kind of throw that out there. Like, I wrestled all over the world, but right. you have. Uh, what were some of the greatest countries that you've been involved with? Because you just got back from a big overseas tour. Yeah, no, and in fact, and you bring that up, I would say Australia by really? far. It's my first tour, just got back not too long ago and, and had an absolute blast. Yeah. The people, the culture. Nice. Uh, it's like... England, but San Diego, very weird, <laughs> and uh, great fans, great fans, yeah, I love it, absolutely love it. Going back, very excited. Now, you know, I look at you and I see what great shape you're in, I mean, you've kept the weight down, you know, you still look like you can go in any wrestling ring anywhere in the world and still wrestle, which you can, but it also makes a lot of people wonder, and people have asked me, why the one last ride tour, why are you hanging up the boots so soon? Well, you know, it's it's been, I mean, looking back now, and it's hard to say when I'm, when I'm talking to you, since yeah. I've known you since I was oh, a kid, yeah, but yeah, yeah. this is year 17, wow. and uh, I know, um, That's crazy. Just looking back, I'm, I've always kind of been someone that is a progressive thinker, and I like to see kind of where my path is going. Mm -hmm. and, and unfortunately, in our business in this country, mm -hmm. there's only one or two places that you can go to really make a living. Right, right. So I'm not getting any younger, mm -hmm. and uh, truthfully, and I don't know that uh, that glass ceiling, as it were, is going to break for me. So I'm just being realistic about it. I don't want. I, no disrespect to the guys that are going to be out there. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be 45 or 50 years old yeah. working the independent circuit. I have a family, right. and uh, it's time to think about them. Beautiful family indeed. Of course, your wife Sarah's here in, in, in Las Vegas, and your uh, beautiful child back home, I'm sure. And obviously, you know, I think that there's going to be some more room for you down the road. Maybe some more kids running around in the old Pierce household. I'd love to see that. I got two. That's <laughs> I think two's enough for me. I got one of each, so we're good. <laughs> yeah. Boy and a girl, I meant to say that. I'm sorry. Boy and a girl, of course. But, uh, you know, professional wrestling, it means a lot to a lot of us. Uh, I obviously fell in love with the business at a young age like yourself. Was lucky enough to be on TV and do a radio show in Waukegan, Illinois. Of course, our old stomping ground. And uh, you getting into the business like you did and running with the ball and I said it before and I'll say it again Rick I'm very proud of what you've accomplished uh, you're a hell of a guy for one and a great professional wrestler and there are a lot of Adam Pierce fans out there I'm not kidding you if you look up wrestlers out there Adam Pierce his name is all over the place I'm not being I'm not being goofy here I'm serious NWA champion that holds a lot of prestige I think at the end of the day, when I am down and the boots are hanging up on the wall, that will probably be the, the thing that I'm most remembered for. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm very humbled by that and by the fact that uh, the way I carried that belt, I think, is very, very much in the same way. Guys like Jack Briscoe and Harley Race yeah. and wow. Dusty Rhodes. And just being a touring champion, that's all I ever wanted to do with that belt and treat it with the respect that it deserves. Yeah. And uh, I hope history remembers that. Yeah, Terry Funk, of course, as well, who's here right now, the yeah. Funker. And actually, he gave me the shirt I got on here underneath it, the Funk U University. Uh, great guy watch, as well. Watch your mouth. Yes, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say <laughs> Funk U. Anyway, but again, Adam, you know what? It's a pleasure. I don't even feel like this is a job when I hold the microphone next to this gentleman right here. He's a good friend of mine. And I wish you continued success, good health, of course, and uh, whatever roads you go down in the future, may they all be smooth. Thank you, and I appreciate that, and thank you for kind of opening a door, as it were. And again, all blame for anything I may have done, including getting thrown out of here last night, <laughs> can, now, wait a can be attributed to Brian Shank. <laughs> you, you told me the bottle wasn't open. Now, come on, I, you know that. Okay. We're going to go uh, play some cards now, right? Is that what we're calling it yeah. now? Yeah, it's a code word. Card game, card game. All right, again, Adam, thank you so much, man. We're going back. We're going to come back with some more interviews. We've got them all here. Don't go away. We've talked about it, wrestling fans. Everybody who's anybody in the world of professional wrestling is here today at the Gold Coast Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada. And let me tell you something. This is not just anybody. This is Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, good friend of mine, yeah. two-time NWA champion, intercontinental champion, tag team champion. If you put all your titles in a 70-page notebook, you need another one because that's a lot of prestige for you. I need another one? I think so. To what, fill up all the titles? Well, you know, um, the one I, I, I never had was... Uh, with the company I'm currently working with. Mm -hmm. I had the Intercontinental, but right. ne never a WWE World Champion from that company. Well, I, I don't think that takes anything away from you, but it would be nice to see as the World Champion. It's just nice to have as, as, as one of my accolades and mm -hmm. hanging on the wall type thing, yeah. you know, just to, just to say throughout my career. Mm -hmm. Although in today, uh, you'll see that um, that world championship, heavyweight world championship, seems to be seems to be passing along about every other month. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it does. I like the picture on the CAC program with you holding the NWA championship across right. your across your shoulder like that, and got the fist going. I remember that time back in '89 when you came in, you and Ric Flair. I mean, when I talk about professional wrestling matches, yeah. and I try to level them out, I try to say who's the best, who's the worst. I always say, well, was it a Steamboat Flair match? And they'll be like, well, it wasn't that good. 
So, I mean, you and Flair, anybody you wrestled, Rick Rude, Sting, I mean, you guys are always great inside the ring, and you're one of the best. Well, you know, Brian, thank you. I, uh, I've had a lot of guy comment to me, and what I mean by a lot of guys, it's, it, it could be a, you know, uh, Don Morocco. Mm -hmm. It could be uh, Jake the Snake. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, you know, Ric Flair, Randy Savage. Um, they always they, they always came up to me and they said, you know, Ricky, you, you had some kind of way or a knack of always bringing the best out on uh, on the whoever I was working yeah. with, you know, the program. Mm -hmm. uh, I, re I remember Jake Roberts came up to me and said, you know, when I found out that I was going to get hooked up with you, I st I started had to, I knew I had to get in shape. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I said, well, Roberts, what is that? I said, I know you don't go to the gym, so what what does that mean? You cut back on a beer every, every now and then? Or, but he actually told me he started doing treadmill and steppers and ellipticals, you know, right. just to get get a better win because uh, I, I seem to have a tendency of pushing guys. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, when you get down to the ninth hour and, you, and, you're, and you're into the last four or five minutes of your match, mm -hmm. which could be uh, at the 40 or 45 minute mark, right. and, and um, just to blow everybody away, including the boys watching in the back and the fans watching there uh, up close, to see uh, two guys perform after being in a war yeah. for 40 or 45 minutes is uh, can, cannot leave you but having the wow factor. Yeah. And, and that just comes down to uh, conditioning. Without a doubt. And, you know, when you talk about the well-conditioned athletes, I mean, you come to mind, obviously, Ric Flair. I heard nobody could beat Ric Flair on the Stairmaster back in the day. Is that true? Uh, well, you know, there was a point in time <laughs> in our career, and I will go back... Uh, I'm going to go back to the mid before I went to the WWE, okay. and uh, that's, that has to be 85-ish uh, earlier to mm -hmm. where uh, we had a little personal thing going on with uh, the Stairmaster. And it wasn't that we were doing it side by side, but uh, more times than not, uh, if we were wrestling against each other, working against each other that night, he would always say, Ricky, I did uh, Stairmaster at level 18 for 30 straight minutes. <laughs> oh, you know, and if anybody knows that, you, oh, I think at that uh, Stairmaster goes up to level number 20. Yeah. And it's really like having no resistance. Right. And you're going full bore, and, but do it for a half an hour straight. So he'd always be throwing stuff like that. Now, I don't know if it was a sight game from Ric Flair, although uh, he, he is that type of guy. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, because then it would carry on into being a one-on-one -on -one deal in the ring. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, an underlining uh, personal v thing that we would have the, between the two of us is who could blow up who. Yeah. Um, maybe some <laughs> of the boys knew it, some of the boys heard of talk about it, yeah. but that seemed to be a ongoing thing with Flair and I starting all the way back uh, when we started in 1977 wow, yeah. and carrying it up through to uh, 1989 mm -hmm. you know so 12 years of, uh, of a grudge type of thing uh, professionally mm -hmm. and respectfully sure. but it was always on a who could blow up who? Yeah. And you know, I don't. As, as many of the hundreds of times that we uh, wrestled against, worked against each other, there was never a time to where I could come back to the locker room and say uh, I had him tonight. <laughs> that I blew up Ric Flair. Yeah. There was never, never, ever a time. Well, I think like yourself, you know, Ric Flair and and people like yourself. I mean, even staying for a while, there are 60 minute broadways, yes. and and that's a lot of time inside the ring because yeah. there weren't many down times for you with the rest holds and whatnot. You right. were always well conditioned and raring yeah. to go. And I don't think you liked uh, those rest holds too much did you you like to keep moving well um th there's a point in time in the match to where things do have to settle sure, down sure. because it ends up being like a tennis match yeah you know just watching the ball go ping ping you know back and <laughs> forth back and forth back and forth okay. and and after a while that even gets monotonous right. even though it might be exciting and we're moving around a lot mm -hmm. but there has to be a, a point in time to where uh, not only us guys have to take a moment and take a breath all right, but the fans have to, and even though they may not know it, but when those times do happen, it allows them to digest mm -hmm. what they just saw yeah. or what, what the match has been dictating for the last four or five minutes. Sure, sure. So uh, um, um, I will say that uh, you know, I do like a lot of the action stuff, but I also uh, understanding that into what making a match a four or a five star, you do have to have those moments to where mm -hmm. things just slow down, let everybody digest and think about what just took place, what has happened. I understand why, what, they're, what is happening now to mm -hmm. each individual in the ring. And it's only because you're allowing the fan to think back on what they just saw. Well, not only that too, but you know, we also talked about mechanics, you and I earlier. I mean, there's, you know, the pitcher in baseball has to have great mechanics.
mechanics to be a successful pitcher. Right. I think the consummate pro wrestler also has to have those abilities. And when I talk about stuff like that, I mean like the deep arm drags. I remember Gorilla Monsoon would always say, look at the deep arm drags by Ricky yeah. the Dragon Steel. No one can deep arm drag like Ricky the Dragon And he was right. I mean, you would literally be on your back parallel to the mat with about six inches to spare, and you'd have the I, guy flap. Ama amazing Brian, stuff. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna help. I'm gonna pat me in the back even more. Okay. Uh, uh, there's a picture of Snook and I. We wrestle in Japan, and I have got literally three feet between my body being laid out parallel and the mat. And the snooka is another two feet above me. So there's five feet of snooka, me three feet above the mat, and it's a great shot. Um, Dating back to the early 80s, I've kept that Japanese magazine. I teach and instruct now in FCW in Florida. Yeah. And um, every now and then when they talk about uh, the young talent, talk about my arm drag, I bring that fold out. Do you? And I show that to them. <laughs> and, um, you don't just go in there and give them one, you know, yeah. lead by example? I do. Yeah. I do. I bet. Um, but um, the question on... Uh, being the the consummate guy or or taking pride in what you're working and uh, you know that was always one uh, I think there, that 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 type of uh, attitude was very popular b back with everybody mm -hmm. you know you got the Greg Valentines and the Blackjack Mulligans and the Paul Jones and and then when you go up further north you know the Bruno Sammartinos and the Pedro Morales you mm -hmm. know um, Tony Gurria, you know, uh, over in the Von Erichs area down in Texas, you know, the, there there was a class of guys that always took a lot of pride in what they did and how they worked. Mm -hmm. um, a, a very underlining thing that uh, wrestling magazines were very popular back then, yeah. and and uh, the Dave talk, Dave's yeah, and the uh, talk, yeah. the talk of each guy and how well he was doing. You know, I would read how well the Von Erichs were doing. I would read how Bruno was doing. Yeah. I would read how guys up in the AWA and Vern Gagne's territory were doing. Di guys with Bill Watts, mm -hmm. you know. And I always, and then you're looking at the top ten ranking. Yeah. You know, understanding that it's a work. Yeah. But you know, <laughs> why am I not in the top ten? Or else, if I'm in the top ten, why am I not in at least in the top five? Or then, or why am I not in the top three? Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so. Well, you know, you talked about FCW too, Ricky. And those people who are involved with F FCW who have a chance to work with someone like you, that's a heck of an honor because anybody can go to a wrestling school and learn from somebody who's been in the business, you know, maybe right. five, six years. But when you got someone like yourself, and I know Bill DeMott doing the tough enough and everything else, right. being that type of person to really drive it into their heads that to be the best, you've really got to work at this sport. I call it a sport. I've always said it was a sport. It's a great sport. Sure. And to be the best, you got to learn from the best. So they're very lucky to have you. I can well, say that right now. Well, Brian, thank you, you know, for that. But uh, uh, there's a lot of guys that are great athletes. Yes. And what I mean by that, they know how to take a hip toss mm -hmm. or get body slammed or suplex or dives off the top rope or 450s or yeah. her Karanas and, and, and or the whatevers. Yeah. But the thing that I try to teach is when do you do that yeah. in the course of a match? Mm -hmm. And then not only asking the question when, if they don't know, telling them when to do it and the reason why. So not, not as much as when and why, but it's just so important that in storytelling, mm -hmm. in a match, all those things do make a, a reason and, and a difference. Mm -hmm. And I've had many guys that I've, they've come up to me and they said, Ricky, did you watch my match? And I said, yeah, but why'd you do that in the, in the first two minutes? Let's just give you an example, a DDT. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Why would that you was, do that? Was always a finisher. Yes. Mm -hmm. Why would you do that in the first two minutes, and then 30 seconds later, you guys are out running around the ring? I don't understand that either. I've always questioned that. Yeah. So, yeah. and they wouldn't have an answer for it. Well, it's just something that we need to fill in. Okay. <laughs> fill in. Okay. <laughs> okay. But uh, an expression that I've used a lot is that you've thrown it away. Yeah. That type of a move is something that should last for a couple of minutes to let a guy have a chance of recovering. Right. And not just 20 seconds later, you guys are hitting the ropes and running around and doing dives and all this after a guy just got DDT'd. Well, and I think that you can add support to that argument that you're giving because obviously back in 1986 when Jake the Snake Roberts gave oh, you the DDT, wow. you know, that really set a standard for what the DDT meant. When they yeah. asked Jake the Snake, what does it mean? He goes, the end. <laughs> he did in an interview. Yeah. He goes, it means the end. And that's what it meant for you in that match. Well, you know, um, pulling away the mat and exposing the cement oh. floor. I just did not protect myself and get my hand down there fast mm -hmm. enough. I asked, my head did hit, I did suffer a concussion. Um, oh. My head did swell up. I almost looked like, uh, what's that, the elephant man. Oh, jeez. Yeah. I mean, it was so uh, disfigured. Yeah. Um, 
No, and then at the moment, you know, an hour later, guys are coming in the locker room and they're going wondering if I was even going to, if, if, if the career was over. Um, so there, there's a classic example, and the way he dragged me, I remember uh, oh. the way he dragged me in the yeah. ring, and I'm like a wet noodle, I'm limp, yeah. you know, I can't even support myself. And, and um, see, those are typical suggestions that I give, or examples that I give on why would you do such a move in the first 30 seconds of a match. Yeah. And, and, and then I understand if it's called for, but then what follows that, okay? And what doesn't follow it is these guys that are jumping around and doing this and doing that and making it seem like that you didn't do something like that 30 seconds earlier, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I, I totally un understanding it, you know, so. You know, going here before we conclude the interview, I really want to say congratulations to you as well yeah. because later on this evening right here at the Gold Coast Hotel in Las Vegas, Nevada, we're going to be seeing you taken up on the podium up there, the Lou Thez Award. Yeah. Now, you and I had some good talks about Lou Thez. Yeah. You talked on the radio show a couple weeks ago about I'm the... I'm using that example tonight. Okay, I won't, I won't blow it because okay. it'll be shown afterwards anyway. Right. But that is tremendous. And I'll tell you, Ricky, yeah. this is a great award for you to win. I think there's nobody really right now who's more deserving than you because uh, Lou Thez, hell of a guy. Yeah. You knew him. You worked out with him. You yeah. wrestled him. Uh, this is going to be a great for you tonight. What does this mean for you to stand up on all your peers and all your fans and get this award? Well, yeah. earlier, uh, in the la well, earlier in the last couple of days, I've really been thinking, what does it mean? Um, ultimately, the award doesn't mean anything if there wasn't a Lou Thez. Mm, true. And, and what I mean by that statement is that everybody that's in the business or out of the biz this business that understands who Luthez was mm -hmm. would understand what I mean by without Luthez there wouldn't be this award. It might be under somebody else's name. I don't know if it would carry any more merit or any more weight. But the fact remains that this award being presented to somebody each year under the name of Luthez has got to, within our organization and our clique and our, and our business, mean a lot. Oh, sure. It, it means a lot. Um, it also tells me the people that actually, under counsel, took names into consideration on who this award should be given to this year, 2012, that um, they have a lot of respect for me. Mm -hmm. And um, I have nothing but being humbled and, and a lot of gratitude and thanks for it. Right. And you say respect. I know that speaking for all the wrestling fans who are in attendance here this evening yeah. or just all around the world yeah. who know the work of Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, I can definitely echo those statements. We yeah. do respect you. Great wrestler, great man, great yeah. family guy. This man is true blue. What you see of him right now is him. I know. I'm a friend of his. I know this stuff. So, Ricky the Dragon Steamboat, it's always a pleasure and honor, my friend. You take good care. And tonight, just remember, don't get nervous up there. Well, yeah, I hope not. <laughs> you know, you never know. But I did, uh, t the last time you and I talked on uh, uh, on your show, um, we got to break a beer later. We will. Oh, yeah. We got we got to. Matter of fact, I saw you walking around with some Coors Lights the other night, and I thought one was for me, and he walked right past me, and he, he gave it to uh, Mickey J. But that's okay. That's okay. Uh, well, the reason why, I was waiting for you to stop me and say, hey, Ricky, I got one for you. But <laughs> You got it, brother. But, you know, you, you walking around empty-handed, how can I stop you and ask, where's mine? <laughs> So, that being said, anyway, uh, thanks everybody. All right, we're coming back with some more interviews. Again, thank you to Ricky the okay. Dragon Steamboat, the man, the legend, the dragon. Take care.